Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about prosecuting Israel for genocide. We are talking with the terrific independent journalist Sam Husseini. Sam is on Substack at Husseini.substack.com. Uh, you can find him all over the internet uh, wearing many hats, doing many important jobs as uh, an independent journalist and advocate. Sam Husseini, welcome back to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much for inviting me, David. Thanks. Uh, I think you were the best possible person to invite on a very timely topic, which is prosecuting the crime of genocide, which has been publicly, shamelessly before our eyes for months. It's about time uh, someone tried to prosecute it. Um, what's what's exactly happening and why has it taken this long to happen? Um, it, it's taken a while to happen, longer than it should have, in part, I think, because the International Criminal Court prosecutor um, went off uh, to uh, outside of Gaza and basically, you know, had this photo op saying, I'm the cop on the beat, basically. So a lot of people, a lot of countries uh, and a lot of groups went to the ICC, the International Criminal Court hoping that that would, you know, have some kind of redress, um, but nothing was forthcoming. And that was kind of predictable. The ICC has been something of a scam. It has been basically an instrument of U.S. policy. It's gone after U.S., uh, again, it's gone after African, um, uh, uh, gov you know, government of, governmental officials. And then it went, they went after Putin. Um, it's never gone after U.S. officials, NATO officials, uh, or um, Israel, or any U.S. ally, and, um, and and so people were sort of ignoring this other legal route, which is the International Court of Justice. Now, the International Court of Justice doesn't prosecute individuals, but it adjudicates um, matters uh, before between two states. So you have um, South Africa, which is a signatory to the Genocide Convention, and you have Israel, which is a signatory to the Genocide Convention. So South Africa can effectively sue Israel, saying you are violating the Genocide Convention. Uh, and they um, both uh, ha have agreed to, um, in the past, to allowing the ICJ uh, to adjudicate such matters. So that's why you have a hearing um, this week where South Africa is going to pre present its case. South Africa has already presented its case, actually, in terms of the very detailed 84-page, highly footnoted um, application, they call it, uh, documenting um, Israel's, documenting the background of the situation, documenting Israel's actions uh, since October, and documenting um, Israeli government statements of genocidal intent. Why do you think, I, I, I mean, many of us at the prompting of, of yourself and others uh, had been pushing and are still pushing for governments to do this and to do it in support of South Africa now that it has done it. Why, why do you think South Africa was the one nation? Uh, there, there are 200 countries, they've all got eyes and ears. Why only South Africa? Yeah, you know, I mean, one of the pieces that I wrote, um, and I really didn't want to write it, was documenting how all of these countries were calling Israel, what Israel was doing, genocide. Uh, Brazil, Bolivia, uh, you know, uh, um, Algeria, uh, you know, Jordan, so on and so forth. And But none of them would actually invoke the convention. <laughs> you know, you're, you're saying somebody's breaking a law, but you're not, <laughs> you know, um, invoking the law. Um, so it was really quite appalling. Um, I mean, South Africa, I think in part because of the history of it, that it suffered under uh, apartheid. Uh, so I think that it has paid particular attention um, to Palestine. You go back to the statements by Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, you know, towering figures in South Africa who 
um, you know, w would often say, you know, our freedom is not complete um, uh, un until um, uh, Palestine is free and similar statements. Um, uh, and, and they also have, uh, I think, a very highly uh, capable um, uh, legal team um, in, in, in South Africa that was able to, to pull this together. It was, I think it's no small task. Uh, indeed, quite a lengthy filing full of footnotes, uh, any any slight error anywhere in there and somebody's going to catch hell, um, maybe part of why other nations are more reluctant to do it. But can you can you talk a little bit for people who haven't read it about what's in South Africa's filing? I mean, this is not just documentation of deaths and injuries, but also of genocidal intent publicly <laughs> promoted by top Israeli officials, right? Yeah, yeah, there are several components to it. And I, I've, you know, I've gone through it several times and I, I still, you know, I, I can't retain it all, to be honest with you. I mean, the, the, there's the background part of it, which I found fascinating. They went through all of the previous UN reports during past times that Israel attacked uh, Gaza. God, you know, Israel has done this repeatedly. They call, call it mowing the lawn. And they highlight some of the pertinent parts of that. For example, um, they excerpt from a report from 2010 um, about the attack that happened shortly before then, where Israel back then was saying Hamas is, you know, firing uh, rockets from hospitals, and that's why we have to attack hospitals. Where the well, the UN went in afterwards and said we found no evidence of this whatsoever. So they're you know they're in effect saying you know look we we can't get in there because Israel isn't allowing independent media, isn't allowing international media, isn't allowing independent investigations in this case. But they highlight what happened in the past to show Israel's pattern of deceit in terms of claims uh, regarding that, and then they go through. Um, the actions, um, uh, attacks on um, hospitals, um, humanitarian facilities. Um, they also include attacks on the West Bank, for example, where there is no Hamas, literally hundreds of attacks um, uh, since October. Um, so they, they, they give the specifics in the current case. And then, as you say, they go through the genocidal intent, which is typically the hardest part to prove in a genocide case. Because how do you get inside somebody's head saying, oh, they mean to, you know, eradicate, the, you know, a group in whole or in part being the definition of genocide. Um, but they go through the statements from the uh, defense, so-called defense minister, uh, no food, no electricity, no water. Um, uh, the president of Israel um, talking about, you know, there are no innocents in Gaza, uh, the prime minister uh, invoking the biblical mandate to smite Amalek, which means, you know, eradicate an entire group of people. Um, so they really go through a great deal of information and they back it up time and time again. It's... Uh... Interesting that in the days after the filing, uh, news stories began coming out, not, of course, about the filing in, in Western and U.S. media, but uh, somewhat in international media about Israel being concerned and about Israel's plans to respond and Israel pressuring nations to, to oppose this. What, what possibly can be Israel's defense here? Um, I'm... You know, it's difficult. You know, difficult for me to to speculate um, about that. Uh, the latest thing I saw was that they were planning on, um, you know, showing you know video of um, what ha you know the Hamas attack on October seventh. Uh, uh, I, I guess in an attempt to, you know, be more graphic. I, I don't know if the South Africans are planning on showing video, um, you know, I mean, the, the Israelis have gone through this, this whole process of um, antics that they've been doing at the at the United Nations. Recently at the UN, one of, you know, their representative went there with us, you know, 
a, a yellow star of David as if he's somehow persecuted um you know like a way of you know effectively you know defending himself from accusations of of slaughtering innocent you know thousands of innocent people so th th this government is really incredibly shameless so um you know I, I i i don't know what kind of possible antics they're they're going to attempt to uh, to do um you know i mean I've heard some people be very pessimistic about what's going to happen with the court because, you know, the U.S. and Israel can pressure um, uh, uh, countries and judges associated with countries. The president of the court right now is a former State Department official. Um, uh, there, there are, uh, you know, it could come down to real politic um, in terms of what each country that's on the court thinks it can get out of this. Uh, I, I, I'm not an expert on the court. International lawyers who are, are somewhat more optimistic than some people um, who have, you know, uh, thought that, that Israel would, would, would come out, you know, surprisingly unscathed here. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm genuinely not sure, but I, I, I assume that Israel will attempt all kinds of antics to distract from the core question at hand, which is the substantial case of South Africa laying out the evidence that Israel is committing genocide. We are speaking with Sam Husseini. You can find him online at husseini.substack.com. We're talking about the prosecution of Israel for genocide at the International Court of Justice. Hearings happening on Thursday and Friday. Um, Sam, I'm a little I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but I'm a little surprised at the notion of Israel playing videos of October 7th as a defense of genocide. I know that's been the media approach by Israel, by the U.S. government, by the corporate media has been, to, you know, but revenge is, you know, our culture's highest ideal, but it's not a legal defense of, of any action. Uh, so it it can't be, it can't be revenge. It has to be that somehow showing this video indicates that the genocide is defensive that that it's you know that it's not gross mass slaughter uh of random people that it's not violations of the rules uh, of all the laws against war and the geneva conventions that somehow it's defensive and that seems far more difficult to argue than the glories of of revenge, which which it's fine to argue on CNN. Yeah, um, a couple of things. I mean, that I mean, it's possible that Israel is going to. I mean, I'm just saying that that's one of the things that I heard. So I don't know what they're actually going to do. I mean, that could be sure. spin and disinformation as well. Um, you know, I mean, it's possible that Israel could view the hearings as a media spectacle. Uh, and try to use them in that in that way, and perhaps hope that their behind the scenes pressure on the judges is what actually carries the day. But that's speculative on my part. I, I, I hesitate to to stress the revenge aspect of things. To be totally honest, I mean I'm sure that that's a visceral response to some Israelis. But in terms of the Israeli establishment, I mean, I think that they are pursuing long-term goals of, of, course. of, of, of uh, attempting to damage, to put it lightly, Palestinian society as much as possible for the purpose of acquiring the territory and the water and, you know, uh, ex being a, a settler expansionist state. That's what they do. They drive out people. That's what Israel has done since 1948. And this is simply the latest and perhaps most horrific um, stage of, of that endeavor. Sam, you are uh, a participant in and an observer and critic of the media. Have you ever seen a contrast as stark as the Western media coverage of the lives of Israelis and the lives of Palestinians? Have you ever seen dozens of people valued so dramatically 
higher than tens of thousands of people. It seems it seems starker than I can recall. You might be right. Uh, I'll, I'll be frank, David. I really haven't consumed a ton of. I, I used to consume a lot of mainstream media, um, and I, I don't as much anymore. But I mean, this goes back to me for you know many many years. I mean, I remember you know uh, during the full first Gulf War when you know they were slaughtering Iraqis, and then Saddam Hussein would launch a Scud missile, and you know you know an Israeli would get a heart attack or something and you know and that was you know the the, 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 the you know the, what what the mainstream media put a human face to um so i mean this kind of pattern has certainly been there it it, it may well be worse now i just honestly haven't been consuming the, yeah i mean i mean i should say one aspect of things that that the south africans don't get into but has really stuck in my head is the propagandistic nature though of what Israel did from the very beginning that is to they, they put out the story of the beheaded uh, uh, babies. babies and that to me in a sense is part of the genocidal intent right why did they put that out they put that out because they knew they intended to slaughter a lot of Palestinians and if they put out this story uh, of uh, beheaded uh, babies, they knew that that would buy them more time to get away with more carnage. And, and same thing with the whole rape allegations, which I haven't followed closely, but, but you know, seems to at minimum be exaggerated, and if, if not largely baseless still at this point. I, I, I haven't seen any evidence of that, but I keep, you know, the mainstream media keep, you know, bringing that up and keep poking holes in it. So you, you have the you, you know, the propaganda is almost a key into the geno part of the genocidal intent, right? Why lie? Why lie about these astro uh, atrocities except to try to buy more leeway to commit more carnage? Right. And and completely open and shameless about the opportunism, not this is a horrible tragedy, but this is our 9-11. Right. Meaning this justifies complete Whatever. lawless barbarity without limit you know because the u.s set that example um the, the, and you had one host on msnbc ask an israeli official have you have you not killed any babies not killed any children and the solution was to was was to kick that guy off of msnbc get rid of his show that that solved that yeah 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 you've seen that i mean you you, you know you, you had i mean different sectors of the media to, you know, operate in different ways. So you had, you know, sort of the rise of some Arab and Muslim voices on MSNBC, which were sort of useful to the establishment if they were, you know, demonizing Russia or something like that, because they sort of went along with that program, at least tacitly. Um, and now that those same hosts are, you know, <laughs> not going along with the establishment program 100% of the time, um, yeah. saying, hold on, we're, we're going to, you know, I want to try to humanize the Palestinians here a little bit. Uh, suddenly those, those same hosts are on the out. So that kind of gives you a glimpse as to how insidious the whole system is and how it uses people and so on. There, there's a couple things, Sam Husseini, that strike me about the, the term genocide here. One is that contrary to everybody's beliefs, uh, it seems pretty clear that the proportion of the deaths in wars like the war, the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, the proportion of the deaths that were U.S. deaths was actually smaller than the proportion of the deaths in the in the genocide in Gaza that are Israeli deaths. Uh, I mean, they, these were even more one sided slaughters of men, women, children, babies, the elderly. Uh, but no one pulled out the word genocide. Yet here, and this is the other thing that strikes me, you have this quintessential case of genocide where everybody's calling it genocide and it's, and it's happening very quickly in front of everyone's eyes. Uh, and nobody says never again. For decades, we're told this is just a central pillar of Western morality. Never again. It's it's pulled out as war propaganda. We have to, you know, we have to attack Libya because genocide. Uh, but it's just abandoned. Uh, what? 
how 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 is how are either of these things possible if I'm right about either of them? Um, it's a really fascinating point, David. Um, I mean, you have, I mean, you had a, a lot of civilian, you know, deaths, ki killings in Iraq and in Afghanistan, without without a doubt. Um, and it, it would be interesting to see in retrospect if it would make sense to to lay out the genocide convention in that technically you couldn't because uh at least not against the united states because the u.s has a reservation on the relevant article legally speaking not ethically speaking but legally speaking the u.s doesn't uh submit to the adjudication of the international court of justice on the genocide convention israel does south africa does and that's why we have the current suit there, there um, is an argument that lawyers will make and supporters of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons make this argument that there are treaty obligations and laws that suggest that the United States must abide by international law when there is a global consensus around an international law, regardless of whether the United States has ratified the treaty at all, never mind added its reservations, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that certainly could, could well have merit um uh, uh i mean i mean you you are seeing I, I don't know what the proportions are of you know you know hamas fighters being killed vis-a-vis -vis iraqi soldiers being killed if that's the alleged goal of war i mean i don't believe that i don't believe that the israeli goal is necessarily hamas fight. I, you know when people say it's indiscriminate of course not. I, I, I think they're targeting journalists. I, I, I suspect they're targeting the infrastructure of, of Palestinian society. So clearly, uh, yeah. Um, and and so I think that what you're saying is right in terms of that those things could fit under genocide. The, the, the case of Palestinians is, is a bit different because, I mean, for all of the U.S. designs in Afghanistan and Iraq, they, they, you know, they didn't seem to want to, you know, do a settler colonial enterprise, right? They, they wanted to, you know, destabilize, to shatter society, to reconfigure it, but they didn't want to, uh, you know, settle it with people from Brooklyn, per se. Uh, Only whereas, within military bases. Yes, true. True, but not you know, and, and which are you know still uh, there at least in Iraq, um, um, whereas it, Israel is a settler colonial expansionist project. So th there is a distinction there, but I don't think that that necessarily changes the assessment that you're making that they both could well constitute genocide. I, I think so. In any case, uh, one-sided slaughters is an accurate description. Um, uh, Sam Husseini, the, the thing that uh, I've enjoyed most from your work in recent months has not been your wonderful assistance and, and wisdom on this project, but your questioning of State Department uh, spokespeople at their uh, press conferences. Uh, it's, it's just shocking to have someone in the room asking a question that isn't part of the show. You know, it's like the magician's got the room full of assistants and there's this guy sneaks in who's who's from the audience. You know, ha, talk a little bit, a minute, the, we've got maybe four minutes left. What has been your recent experience uh, in that place? Well, it's been rough. Um, they, the, the main spokesperson actually hasn't called on me since October, um, Matt Miller. Um, but for, for a week, he was out, and um, uh, the assistant uh, was there, and he called on me for four days straight, and I did everything that I possibly could with that. I actually first raised the genocide convention in one of my questions there. That I was part of what got it galvanized. Uh, and I asked them if they were leaning on the Palestinian Authority to not invoke it, because right? the Palestinians could have invoked this. You know, we, we, we waited and we waited. South Africa finally did. The Palestinians could have done it themselves. 
right? And I presume it was because they were being threatened uh, in doing so. And so I asked the State Department exactly that question. Um, and I also asked them about the Gen the G G Geneva Conventions. The, the State Department seems to not reckon, they, they keep saying, we want Israel to abide by international law. But when I ask them what law, they won't say. You know, they won't say that they recognize the Geneva Conventions as applying to occupied territory. So if the Geneva Conventions, which are, are what, you know, you know, protect people in occupied territory, if they don't apply, then there's really no law that Israel is being constrained by. So um, it's been great when they call on me and when they don't, uh, I've, you know, hollered stuff out occasionally with mixed results. Um, I've been suffering from bronchitis lately, so I haven't been up to, you know, <laughs> fighting in that outing. That. That. Yeah. But but if it if I have to do that, I'll do that. Um, you know, and and you know, I'm you know, I'm I'm seeing some other journalists get in there and ask some questions, not quite with the, um, you know, confrontational approach that I do. Um, but at, l at least some other things that, that go off script. It's been funny for me too, getting, you know, mainstream journalists, you know, come up to me afterwards, thanking me, you know, yeah. <laughs> for things that they don't <laughs> feel like they're wanting to do. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, I, I hope that, that someone follows your example or that you are there and they call on you, uh, or you force them to listen to you. Uh, on this topic as it moves forward. Um, we've, we've got just two minutes left, but it, it, if, if there's governments threatening other governments on this, it's not just Israel, it's the United States more than likely, and, and mm -hmm. we don't know about it, but the majority of the weapons are from the United States, the dozens of defenses and vetoes at the United Nations are from the United States, the, the, Israel couldn't do this without the United States, uh, and if Israel is guilty of genocide, some other governments are complicit, right? Absolutely. Absolutely, they are. Um, and so what we hope to see is that, it, it, assuming that the International Court of Justice does its job, and that other countries, we should emphasize, other countries, and I have a whole page on this, and, and, you, and you've done great work on this, getting other countries to uh, issue declarations to back up South Africa, um, uh, to, um, uh, you know, get, you know, so that it's not just South Africa doing this, it's other countries joining in. You, you, other things can open up like universal jurisdiction, other countries prosecuting individuals, uh, the UN General Assembly, if the International Criminal Court refuses to move, you can have the um, UN General Assembly uh, form a tribunal. Um, in the past, you've had the Security Council formed tribunals for Rwanda and Yugoslavia. There's nothing to stop the General Assembly from forming a tribunal to go after individuals. Um, so hopefully, a lot of other avenues to, you know, to to get some justice here can be opened up. Absolutely, we will have links to Sam Husseini up at talkworldradio.org, and we will have links to where you can take actions online on this issue. Sam Husseini, thanks for everything you're doing and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you for all your great work, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.